It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our second John McCann Education Day here at the BU Medical Campus. Um, this event was inaugurated last year to honor Dr. McCann as he retired as being the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And John, would you please stand up so we can all recognize you? <laughs> this year, uh, we've expanded the effort and I'm sure the rewards by including uh, also the School of Dental Medicine and the School of Public Health. And uh, one of the deans from the School of Dental Medicine, Dr. Hutter, is here. Would you please stand? And we're, we're, we're delighted to have both these schools joining. I, don't, don't, I haven't yet seen the person from the School of Public Health, but you'll meet them later. Um, I think this will be a very valuable and interesting day. And I, I welcome you all into the lectures and to the workshops and also, of course, the posters and informal discussions around them. I, now, I also look forward very much and am, am very pleased to introduce Dr. Sharon Levine, uh, who is the chair of this event, was also the chair last year of the inaugural event uh, Sharon is an associate professor of medicine here and very importantly is the newly named de associate dean for academic affairs. So she will, will come up in a minute and get our program underway. Um, Sharon trained at Einstein and Yale, came to BU in uh, uh, 1989. She's been very active here in educational programs, both the medical school and particularly the graduate medical education level. She's developed many innovative and interesting programs, was awarded the Metcalf Prize, which is Boston University's highest award for teaching, and has just recently been elected to the American Board of Internal Medicine uh, on the test panel for geriatrics questions. So Sharon brings a great deal of interest and vigor and action and intelligence to this job and I'm sure that that she will uh, do great things here in the school and also in the campus in conjunction with the schools of dental medicine and public health so Sharon come Well, good morning, and thank you very much, Adrian, for your kind words. I'm very much looking forward to working with all of you as I, I take on my new role um, and this exciting challenge. Uh, on behalf of the entire planning committee, I'd like to welcome you to the long name of this day, which is the Dr. John McCann Education Day Showcasing Health Sciences Education at the Boston University Medical Campus in, in, uh, in a spirit of inclusiveness. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity before we even get started to thank Dr. Adrienne Rogers. Um, for 28 years, um, Dr. Rogers has been a distinguished member of the Department of Pathology and uh, Laboratory Medicine at uh, the School of Medicine and has been a professor of public health at the school of, uh, uh, for the last 22 years. Uh, for many years, she and Dr. Leonard Gottlieb directed the pathology course here at the medical school, which was one of the most highly ranked courses always. Uh, in 1992, she became the director of the Office of Medical Education and during that time really changed the curriculum which had been standard lecture based dark room with slides into more small group efforts, uh, small group learning styles and, uh, and brought us into the closer to the new millennium as we are as we have moved into now. Um, she's now incorporated computer-based learning and evidence-based medicine into the, into the curriculum. Um, but I especially want to thank her for being the acting Associate Dean for Academic Affairs over the last year since Dr. McCann's retirement. Um, her leadership has been full of accomplishment. During this past year, we have integrated the, the um, second year course, um, uh, which 
I think we'll hear more about uh, uh, in, in um, Dr. Aritz's um, talk. And I, I think that it's very important to recognize that it's hard to make these kinds of changes. Um, she's really transformed the preclinical and clinical curriculum and pointing them to a far more integrated approach. So I look forward to uh, continuing to work with all of you and to take on t the baton that um, Adrian has passed to me. And um, what all of you don't know is that um, Dr. Rogers has spent the last 30 years weaving her way through the streets of um, Boston and its suburbs, commuting by bicycle from Winchester to here and back home, 30 miles round trip uh, through Harvard Square. I can't even imagine it, um, Dr. Rogers. So uh, thank you very much for your efforts on behalf of the medical school and um, all the work that you've done for us. Um, as, as Dr. Rogers alluded to, because the program last year was so successful, we decided to include and expand um, the program to include um, educators at the schools of dental medicine and public health. And we are very thankful for the support of Deans Hutter and Frankel at the dental school and Bob Meenan at um, the School of Public Health. It's been, it's been wonderful having their participation in planning this event. There are many talented educators here on the campus, uh, among the faculty and even among the trainees, both in basic sciences, clinical services, and those who develop curriculum at the School of Public Health. Um, you're producing wonderful scholarship here, nationally and even internationally. Today is a day to really celebrate these accomplishments and to share and to learn who your potential collaborators are, to get to know each other, to network, and I hope you'll do a lot of that at lunchtime. We've expanded the lunch, the lunch hour this year um, and poster sessions session so you can get a chance to do that um, and to have fun. And I really think you should have fun as you get to know each other. Educators all think alike, so it's a wonderful thing. We're thrilled that 110 people registered for this event today and there are 27 posters plus all the workshops. Um, so this is, it. this is remarkable given your very busy personal and professional lives and enjoy this day. A few logistics before I introduce Dr. Aritz. You've all received a packet that contains um, on the right side the program booklet which contains biographical information, the schedule, and workshop descriptions. It also includes um, all of the abstracts and the, the poster numbers which correspond to the boards that they're on. Um, and, and the oral presentations that will be, um, uh, that have received awards. Um, it also has a list of the major teaching awards across the campus um, in the past year. In the left pocket is today's schedule with the breakout rooms and an evaluation form, which I'll talk more about later. There's a prize attached to filling it out, so, so please uh, keep posted. Um, and I also want to point out that posted on the event website is the start of a compendium of people who do scholarship in health education. And you should feel free to add your name to that. It's open. It's going to be on the website. You can find potential collaborators there or people who might even be interested in reviewing your work as you, who may have more experience as you apply for education grants. Following my remarks, we'll hear from Dr. Aritz, uh, his keynote address. This will be followed by the morning workshops beginning at 1015, the luncheon and poster session here from 1145 to 145, and then a breakout for afternoon workshops from 2 to 330. Then we'll return here promptly at 3.45 for an award ceremony and two oral abstract presentations given by the awardees. It's now my pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Thomas Aritz. He's currently the Vice President of Global Programs at Harvard Medical International and Associate Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Aritz received his MD degree from Harvard Medical School and completed a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology and fellowship in cardiovascular pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's held academic appointments at Harvard since uh, 1978 and has served as a pathologist at the Leahy Clinic, the Deaconess Hospital, and most recently at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's been very actively involved in the education of residents, fellows, and medical students since 1978. In 1992, he was recruited to direct the cardiovascular portion of the second year New Pathway curriculum at Harvard Medical School. And um, he successfully um, led the expansion of this course to become the 11-week module um, of the Human Systems course, which includes cardiovascular, respiratory, hematologic, and dermatological pathophysiology integrated with pharmacology and microbiology. If that sounds familiar to some of the people in the medical school, we have just we are right in the midst of all of this. Rob Lowe knows this probably better than anybody else. And so we're, we're um, very grateful to the people who have led the way in trying to do this. 
Um, he has outstanding contributions as a medical educator that have been recognized with numerous teaching awards. In the last 10 years, his work has mostly focused on uh, work in the design of medical curriculum and the organizational structure to support um, curricular change around the world, and I mean around the world on multiple continents. Um, he joined Harvard Medical International in 1999 as the medical director for international education. And in this capacity, um, he has served as a team leader for the re team leader as a reform for medical education for a number of institutions around the world and contributed to the development of curricula at new medical schools all over the world. Um, so we're very lucky to have his experience as he comes and speaks to us today um, at our second annual John McCann Education Day. He's agreed to present a keynote address um, appropriately titled Managing Change in Health Professions Education Experience from the Trenches. This topic is very timely for us here at the medical school and many schools, including those on the medical campus, as we prepare for new competency-based integrated curricula. This talk will be personally very helpful to me as I face the new challenges and opportunities in my, in my new role. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Thomas Aretz. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Sharon, for these kind remarks. Uh, I always feel after an introduction like this, I should probably quit while I'm ahead. So. Um, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today. And uh, it's really a pleasure to speak to you. And what I'm trying to do today is to talk about change. And I will use a variety of personal vignettes, either by colleagues or myself, to illustrate what I think are four different areas of change that get overlooked, and that is actually doing what you need to do before you do anything. And that is the antecedent steps before you ever start changing anything. Because I think, quite frankly, we often overlook the incredible amount of work that needs to be done before you ever put your first new timetable in. So I'm going to uh, direct my remarks uh, to that this morning. Uh, and please, you can interrupt me at any point in time if you want, and I will also give you opportunities to talk to each other. So why do people change? The vast majority of people actually don't like to change. The vast majority of people actually do not change voluntarily. Most of us change actually in response to threats. <laughs> something bad is going to happen to you unless you do this. Some of us change because something good might happen if we change. Then we often get influenced by people. Somebody says, gee, can you join me in doing this? Sometimes it's ideas, but I'll be honest with you, very often it's this, the government and regulations. Okay? So many of us actually are classically don't voluntarily jump into change and think about every morning when we wake up, what am I going to change today? Okay? So, I'm going to tell you four quick stories to illustrate the four points that I want to talk about. Uh, here is a story that you may be familiar with. You run into a colleague in the hallway. She has recently been asked by the dean to get the new curriculum going. After the usual small talk, she asks you, would you mind co-chairing one of the planning groups for the new curriculum? Before you answer, you ask her three questions. I'm going to give you a minute now to talk to each other what those three questions would be. Okay, I'm going to take a couple of from the, from the, so anybody, what question would you like to ask this person? Yeah. What's the proposed uh, time frame? Okay, what's the proposed time frame? Okay, anybody else? Who else is on the committee? Who else is on the, who am I working with? What are the goals? What are the goals? How many people have asked? How many <laughs> <laughs> And how many people have said no, right? <laughs> Anything else? how much of time it'll take, et cetera, okay? So, well, as, as a matter of fact, this is my story, okay? Because I was actually asked, when I, when I started doing this, uh, a colleague literally stopped me in the hallway and said, Tom, would you mind doing this? 
And there is an old American adage that says that volunteers are people that didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I said yes. Okay, so, so let me, so, but out of this comes a principle. And the principle is that the first step of the four antecedent processes to change is chartering, at least what the business people call chartering. And that is that you understand what you're working on. In other words, I understand what my playing field is. What's the sandbox I'm going to play in? And then secondly, with whom am I playing in the sandbox? Okay, some of the questions that you already mentioned. By the way, these will be posted on the website after my talk. So, so conditions that foster effective group processes. You may smile at some of these, but the first thing you want to know is what am I supposed to do? Clear, engaging directions, number one. And number two, enabling performance situations is how is what I'm going to do with whom I'm going to work help me? And that is the group structure. Is it a well-structured group task? In other words, do I have any control over it? Is it a well-composed group or is it political? What are the norms of behavior? What are the expectations? And how is the organization going to support that? Am I going to get rewarded for this? Are they going to get rewarded for this? Do I have resources? Is somebody going to be there to help me? These are appropriate to questions, appropriate questions to ask anybody in leadership positions that asks you to sit on a committee or a task force. Secondly, curriculum development is a big thing. Okay? And I look at it actually sort of as the as the, as, the, as the hub that connects your vision and goals to what you actually are going to do. It's important to understand, actually, where you fit in here. Am I just doing this? Or am I here? Or am I here? Because, quite frankly, how you're going to work, what you need to do, will determine very much what kind of group you want to put together. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit. There's some wonderful work that's now 50 years old out of industry. And it was done by uh, Clark and Wheelwright. And they actually looked at how products looked very much like the team that produced them. Okay? So they found, and they found that there are four different types of teams. One team is what they called, unfortunately, a functional team, which is where you have four departments with chairs. And each department, one person gets targeted to deal with this development of this new thing. The chairs are connected by dotted lines. They occasionally talk to each other. But ultimately, you report only to your chair. And this is the classic silo, the anatomy department, the biochemistry department, the physiology department. I think we all know this, right? The second structure that came on was what is a light, what's called a lightweight team, where, again, the chairs have most of the direct conversations they appoint somebody in here and a what in industry is called a project manager, and they're connected by dotted lines. In other words, they sort of try to coordinate. That's a classic committee. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with having committees, depending on the task you're trying to accomplish. Then there's something called a heavyweight team, where they actually the chairs have agreed to anoint a team that has power over developing something. And this team actually works on it, just communicates back. That's a task force. When you've actually been asked to create something that people will sign off on, OK? And then finally, there's another team that the University of Munich uses. They sent their students to Boston to work on a new, on a new curriculum, unfettered by anything that's happening back home in Munich. And that's called an autonomous team. Okay? So these are all good teams, depending on what you want to do. So how do you decide which team to choose? And how do you know which team you're on? There are two things you have to ask yourself. How important is the outcome? Do I really worry about the product, what comes out of this? Or how important is there to be agreement? Okay? And, all of, and sometimes you need agreement, and sometimes you're much more worried about what specific outcomes you have. If there is no, don't do it, OK? However, if agreement is your number one important thing, give it to a committee. 
If you don't care about the specific product, give it to a committee to reach agreement and provide general guidelines and leave the details to something else. So at a high level, very often there are committee structures whose major, major importance is to create agreements and general guidelines, okay? You all know the old adage that a camel is a horse designed by a committee, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. We've got a four-legged animal, got some general guidelines, so details can be worked out. If the product is important, but it really is not that important that everybody agrees, give it to somebody who knows how to do it. Okay? Outsource it. Give it to an expert. But if you really worry about agreement, if you really worry about the product, there's just one way of doing this, and it's very painful. And there are lots of articles that people have written about task forces. There are, you know, the norming, storming, forming, and performing. You name it. I mean, whatever you want to do. I mean, there's ultimately this is a very painful process. But it is extremely important if you worry about the specifics and if you worry about that everybody is on place. I don't know if anybody here has ever read the wonderful uh, case that describes the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs. It's a wonderful case because it shows two different task force structures with, as history has told us, quite different results. Also, we understand from the same point of view, this is a lovely article, I love this article. Okay, this article is actually called Lovable Jerks versus, uh, Lovable Fools versus Competent Jerks. Um, <laughs> do you want competence or do you want likability? Now, we all would love to have this. Trust me, these people are rare, okay? Lovable stars are exceedingly rare, okay? Incompetent jerks, clearly nobody wants that. But most of the time, we have a choice between somebody that's very competent, but socially slightly inept, or somebody that everybody likes, but may not be quite as competent, okay? <laughs> And it turns out research has shown that this is what people say they want, but this is what people choose. Again, figure out what you want to get. If really you worry about, if you don't worry about agreement, if you worry about the product, this person is much better than this. But when you need agreement, you need somebody that can do that for you. This comes out of the business literature. I mean, these people have literally studied this, and it sounds awfully common sense, but I find actually that very often when you put groups together, the first thing you need to do is, as Jim Collins says in, um, in his book, he says you got to get the right people on the bus and then tell them where you want them to go. And we often don't really seriously think about getting the right people on the bus. Uh, there is in that article. I mean, here's the here's the here's the reference. You know, you can get it in the article. So ultimately, what your team has to do is three things. It has to create a product that everybody accepts on the outside. Everybody there has to learn something, and the team as a whole has to do something that makes them want to do this again. Okay, and I will argue with you that we often don't go through the pains of choosing the right team in order to get done what we need to get done. And sometimes we have no choice. I had no choice in my course, for instance. All right, next one. This is from my own personal experience. A large public health science school in Europe wants to change its curriculum, but is not sure how and what it will take. Enthusiastic professor and course director approaches the dean and asks, can I be of help? The dean thinks for a while and says, any ideas? Could be anything, right? I mean, if you were the dean, what would you say? Experience yeah, what experience, etc. One thing we often don't think about, and that gets me to the second point: learning. That is discovery, data and information gathering to define goals, and experimentation. 
And what actually happened under these circumstances was that the dean said, oh, I tell you what you can do for me. You can do a survey of your students in your course, ask them what they like and what they don't like, and then I'd like to run a pilot in your course. She said, okay. And it was that pilot that actually turned the whole thing around because what happened was that the, this was you know, the classic, she actually used overheads. This was a woman professor. This, she, over, she used overheads that had been 15 years old. And she recognized all of a sudden when that she, and she had to do this new course, she had to change her slides. She had to change how she was going to do this. And in the middle of the course, she got a phone call from the librarian who said, is there a test that I'm not aware of? Because the students were in the library because the way they had to study actually had changed. So in many ways, she actually paved the way in a small group in that course uh, for a large, for a very large uh, curriculum change. Data. This is an old saying by Charles, by Charles Darwin. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And actually, if you're interested, if you're interested in reading about whether people are able to know what they don't know, there's a wonderful sociologist by the name of David Dunning at Cornell who's coined the phrase of the double jeopardy of ignorance. Not only don't you know anything, you actually don't know what you don't know. Okay, so you actually have to know a lot before you know what you don't know. So the issue is data is important, but on the third point I come to something, it's not everything. So I view solutions and problems as a sigmoidal curve as I view a lot of things in life. I think the sigmoidal curve applies to many, many things. Okay, so understanding the problem versus providing a solution for a long, long time, you will not be able to provide a solution. Because there's a certain amount of critical mass that you need before uh, any biochemist knows this reaction takes off. On the other end is, and I'm going to come back to that later on, once you've reached 80%, just then the, as the hemoglobin dissociation curve, you can pour all the oxygen in there you want. It ain't going to move much. Right? And the interesting thing is I have a good colleague who, uh, who's, works, who's worked in global health for many years who says if you change this, this is uh, public health results versus money spent. Okay? We all know from the hemoglobin oxygen association curve, if you have a 40, if you have a 20% shunt, doesn't matter how much oxygen you put in, PO2 doesn't rise, which means if 40% of 20% of your population doesn't have access to health care, it doesn't matter how much money you pour into it. Okay. Bottom line is, many things in life follow a sigmoidal curve. Understand that you have to put a lot of work in to begin with, and also understand that there's an end point where you need to move on. 80% solutions are fine. Do it, fix it the perfect being the enemy of the good, okay? So the idea is to basically get things out. So take time to understand the multiple perspectives in the group before launching into solution finding and beware of FOG. FOG is a wonderful abbreviation acronym coined by Ronald Hardin, and it stands for prejudices, hunches, opinions, and guesses, okay? It's okay to have, you know, everybody contribute but make sure there's at least some solid data in there someplace. So it's often important to expose the entire group to how concordant or discordant their assumptions are. Okay? Story three. This may sound familiar from my bio. The new director of a major interdisciplinary course was preparing for his first meeting with a 15-person planning group, most of whom outranked him, and all of whom had been on the planning group for several years. He had read all the relevant materials, including a recent study showing that the objectives of the course did not meet all the expectations of courses that followed. He wonders how he should start the meeting. And he did. He did wonder how he should start that meeting. What am I going to do? Do I walk in with a PowerPoint? What do you think? This was 15 fairly heavy hitters that were sitting in the room. 
and I just volunteered to do this. Well, I started like this. I'm not saying it's ideal, but I started like this. I said, hi, I'm a father of four children between now the ages of 20 and 33. As a consequence, I have not given advice in a long time. <laughs> and I only share experiences. Okay? That somehow got the conversation going. Okay? Because it clearly showed that um, I wasn't there to tell them what to do. We're going to come back to that in the next case. But I was actually trying to sort of loosen up the room a little bit and try to get some, uh, some sort of tension out of the room because this new person had been just put on top of them. Now, you mind you, I had no influence over people's promotion. I didn't determine their salary. All I needed to do is I needed to get them together, put a course together that none of them wanted to do with each other. So, bottom line. Mobilizing. So mobilizing storytelling, the use of stories and metaphors. I think that's something we actually don't do very well. Okay? And again, I point you to a wonderful article from, of all things, the Harvard Business Review, which interviewed a lecturer on, on screenwriting from Hollywood. And he basically says that um, when executives need to persuade an audience, most try to build a case with facts, statistics, and some quotes from authorities. In other words, they resort to company speak. The tools of rhetoric they have been trained to use. He argues that executives can engage people in much deeper and ultimately more convincing way if they toss out their PowerPoint slides and memos and learn to tell good stories. As human be beings, we make sense of our experiences through stories. So the whole idea about change process is you have to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to make this personal. And you actually have to be able to put yourself into the story a little bit. Um, the interesting thing that happens, and I refer you to a book called by Paul Bryant, who has written about academic administration. And he's created five, several laws. His second law is that academic administration, universities, have no memory and no conscience, okay? What he basically says is that once we enter as well-meaning human beings into a committee, the outcome of those committee discussions are impersonal. We're all personal pe pe people, but the outcomes of the committee are impersonal, and what comes out of it then becomes what's called here company speak, and then becomes basically the story. It's not the story. Somebody, quite frankly, has to personalize that. Somebody has to be able to tell somebody what that means for them, what it means to themselves, and create a story around what you're trying to do. I think we make neglect like that very often, because stories make things personable. Think about what you're trying to do from a storytelling point of view. Don't be afraid to personalize stories relevant to context, but be prepared, obviously, to deal with the pushback about the remand for evidence as to counter the anecdote. Okay? Yeah? Can you give an example um, of, of how that might be used? Like, what is well, I've used it personally. Uh, I mean, my friend uh, Bruce Dalton. Uh, Bruce was the dean of uh, the medical school in New South Wales. And he had to recruit rural physicians to help him train people in rural Australia. So he went to a rural physician out there who uh, 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 was really reluctant to work with them. And he really convinced him by saying, by first of all saying that he grew up in rural Australia, which he did, and that his father was a physician in rural Australia. So he basically created a physical, a, a, a personal connection that he understood this person's issues and they came away from actually that rural physician being convinced by virtue of this. He could have thrown all the data in there about the Australian healthcare system he wanted. It was that personal story that got that particular physician to change his mind. Okay? So very often, I think we're afraid in professional contexts often to be personal, but it's often much more powerful if it's genuine if it's not contrived. Okay. 
Final story, a newly appointed dean begins the process of consultation with each academic unit to launch a new curriculum planning process. At an early meeting with the basic science department, the department head proceeds to announce that the dean is here to share her thoughts about planning for a new curriculum. A loud interjection from the floor ensues. <laughs> Why do you think that loud interjection was, was, <laughs> was reacting to? The loud interjection actually was, who is the dean to tell us what we should be doing? Okay? Which gets us into three areas that I want to spend a little more time on. One is culture, that is realigning, that is actually changing the organization, understanding the culture, but understanding if you're trying to do something new, you're going to have to actually work with the people to tell them what their new jobs are and how they're going to get managed. So what is culture? I have a couple of quotes for you which I thought were interesting. Culture has been described as the deeply embedded patterns of organizational behavior and shared values, assumptions, beliefs, or ideologies that members have about their organizations or its work. It's a fairly standard definition. I like this one a lot better. Culture is the obedience to the unenforceable. Okay. So you really have to understand what culture is in your organization because culture is self-perpetuating. Culture is what gets people to do on their own what nobody else can make them do. All right, so you have to be clearly understanding what you're working in. And again, there are some wonderful papers that have been written on that in the academic environment. Academic cultures have been described either as collegial cultures, managerial cultures, developmental cultures, or as we all know, negotiation cultures. And I point you to this article, and again, you can get it off the web if you're interested in reading this, but this is a wonderful article that goes into some great detail that was published about three or four years ago in how things run differently depending on what the culture of the organization is. You have to understand the culture of your own organization because it changes dramatically how you approach things, right? Because organizational dynamics and culture, is your culture individually centered or is your culture socially centered? Okay, makes a difference. If it's individually centered rather than socially centered, you will have competition period at the end. And that will be the case in your tutorial group or in your department. If you get rewarded more for individual work rather than what you do for the institution, guess what you're going to do? Okay? Ah, if neither matters, don't do it. Obviously, if individual accomplishment is not that high and it's more social, you accommodate, but ultimately collaboration only happens if it matters to the individual and it matters to the organization. And everything else always is a compromise. This is a slide that sometimes people really are horrified by. Okay, but I happen to love this slide. And I tell you why, because it sort of finally made me understand why different organizations, depending on their culture, work differently. This is some work that's now 25 years old and basically divides how we all work in, the, in an organization, a variety of different, five different pieces. Somebody sits on the top, dividing strategy. Somebody does the work. And somebody gets usually from there to here, unless you're in a startup company. There has to be some technical support, and there have to be some support services. Now, why do I put this here? Okay. Well, different organizations run differently. Some are machines, some behave like organisms, some behave like brains. Academic institutions classically function that way. Cultures, as I mentioned, political system, or some people actually say psychic presence. But depending on what you do, there is an appropriate way of running it, okay? And it depends on whether the tasks are simple or complex or whether your environment is stable or dynamic. If the task is simple and the environment is stable, administrative processes work perfectly. So you know what you're going to do, the task is simple, Everybody gets lined up. 
if there's a dynamic change and it's a simple process, usually entrepreneurial startups happen. Professional organizations, as we all are, usually work in complex environments when things are stable. They work extremely well. The assumption being that skills are normalized, that everybody knows what they're doing. They do not work well when things are changing outside because then you need what I just sort of described, this mutual adjustment. One caveat, the word complex gets overused in virtually anything we do as organizations. There's a difference between complicated and complex. It is complicated but predictable to send a rocket to the moon. It's complex to raise a child. Okay? Most often we label things that are complicated complex, thereby saying no rules can apply. Okay? So, we, so the important thing is to understand that because professional organizations are, often deal with complex issues such as medicine, public health, dentistry, whereas, in, uh, um, whereas sometimes they're just complicated. As a consequence, in a machine type organization, there's a big people on the top, lots of support, big middle management, small operating core. In professional organizations, it's mostly operators and quite frankly, very little on the top. Why do I go through this? Because in universities, both exist side by side. And that's the issue. You have a machine bureaucracy, i.e. the administration, and you have a professional, bottom-up, complex organization, i.e. the professionals. And the twain shall never meet. Okay? The internal struggle between guidelines and rules and, no, no, I know how to do this. Remember? You know, we all have the same skills. Let me do it the best way. Okay? I don't know if people here saw the I was trying to find the clip from the, uh, from the Pirates of the Caribbean. There's a scene towards the end where um, the uh, first mate of the, of the Black Pearl gets asked, what happened to the pirates' codes? What happened to the rules? I, we thought they were just guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> so very often, that's how we as professionals approach it. And if you want to read some, some, some literature in JAMA, for instance, why physicians do not follow guidelines, it's an article. It's an interesting art article to read. Okay. Point is, in universities, large bureaucracies like universities, you will have this side and you will have that side. And there's an issue with it. So how do you deal with it? Well, there are ways to do this. Understand where guidelines are useful what people in the business world call chains, understand where you need to create connections and understand where you want people to work out their own problems. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, some work we did uh, a little while ago. If you have a clinical clerkship, most of our clinical clerkships are all over the place, right? They're in 15 different sites. And there's no way you're gonna make everybody do the same thing because quite frankly, they're not the same. Figure out on a high level what your general guidelines are. Give them to the sites. Make sure the sites report back to you. Make the sites the hub. And then let the sites decide what they do best in their networks, okay? One way. The way we, where we classically fall short in, in curriculum planning, and this is curriculum planning. Organizational structure is curriculum planning. Is that we say, oh, we won't provide any guidelines because they know what they're doing. And we won't provide any oversight. Always say, oh, you have to do it this way. Every Tuesday, you have to talk about diabetes. Okay? Neither one works. So in many ways, this is the complexity of running things like this and understanding what, what methodology we use at one point in time. Finally, don't forget about the individual you're dealing with. The horizon you see depends on where you sit on the flagpole. The horizon you see is, depends on where you sit on the flagpole. If I'm down here, I really, quite frankly, don't care about the future of the medical school. 
Okay? If I'm a tutor in a course, all I want to know is what are you going to pay me? What am I supposed to teach? Are you going to provide me, etc.? But I really, philosophically, be honest with you, don't particularly care. If I'm up here, I don't want to sweat the details down here. Because quite frankly, I never look down the flagpole, I look out. Okay? It's this guy here, who was myself, who needed to understand what does this person do, want for me, and what can I do for the people below me. So understand where you sit on the flagpole and be absolutely clear that the people on, uh, on top of you tell you what your job is. What is your piece of the horizon that you can tell people below what they should be doing? Okay? Because all too often we say, we have this great vision, we want to share it with all of you, but we won't tell you what you need to do on every single day-to-day day, day -day basis. Okay? So this, is ex this was extremely important to me. Again, there's a wonderful article that I'm happy to send to you if you send me an email. It's called Managing Your Boss. Because one of the things we also forget, which I've learned the hard way, is we only manage the people below us. It's much more important to manage people above you. Okay? So one way to help professionals grow, which is what we all want to do, and that's what I said early on is, if you're being asked to do something for the university, it should be something that makes you grow as a professional. Is giving professionals stretch assignments, but a stretch assignment does not mean throwing them off a cliff. A stretch assignment means it has to come with somebody that's there that can help you, coaching, and some form of education that helps you actually do this. Okay? So again, if somebody asks you to run something for the first time you haven't run before, the questions are, to come back what we started, who is going to help me? Are you going to be there to help me? And how will I find out what I need to know? Okay? So, because when do professionals create maximal value? When giving new challenging assignments, when they get to do what they do best, when their personal morale is high, when accompanied by a junior person to coach, when irritations and distractions are minimal. And that gets us back to the flagpole. Make sure the guy on top actually makes sure nothing slides down the flagpole on you, and in a non-hierarchical environment. Okay, so finally what I was trying to do is I was trying to walk through these four things, chartering, understanding what you need to do, learning, getting data and experimenting, mobilizing, telling stories, engaging people, and realigning, changing the organization, understanding the context to ultimately, and that's what needs to happen with change, it needs to become part of the institution. The major, port, the major problem I find with curriculum reform in the, in the, in the world is sustainability of the reform is never considered from day one. You know, there's a good reason why people, why well, there's a show called ER and not chronic care. <laughs> oh, seriously, there, there is, okay? Uh, I, I know the geriatrician's in the room, but there is a good reason for why that is. Because people get excited about doing something new, acutely changing something. Good Lord, taking care of the curriculum, managing it, looking at data, the vast majority of us are not turned on by that. Hence, we forget to do this from day one and actually don't pay attention to the structural, procedural, and emotional context that we need to create in order to do this. Okay? So, my survival guide for change agents. As you know, pioneers are people with arrows in their backs, so you should, you should not die doing this. Make the case and create pressure for change, threaten opportunity, fear or greed, as my colleague calls it. Have a vision for change, articulate it simply. If you can't tell somebody, as my colleague Liz Armstrong says, in an elevator ride what you're trying to do, you haven't thought about it hard enough. Okay? Form power coalitions. In other words, understand where you are. Understand your culture, understand the structure you're working in. Be prepared to negotiate parts of your visions away. Okay? If it's a choice between an earring or drug use with a teenager, I think the choice is pretty simple. Right? The earring is just fine. Okay? 
So understand what you're, what you're trying, what you can give away. Uh, scope the work. This gets done, I haven't talked too much about that because I didn't talk about the management, but understand again the culture, who is for you, who is against you. Create the organization you need to create. Understand what you're supposed to do. Timetable somebody men mentioned. Absolutely, you need a timetable. Chunk the work, that is, divide it out. Have different people do it and understand your resources. Build a team. There are more people in the history of the world that have stood alone on gallows than have stood on victory stands. Trust me on this, okay? Build a team. And by a team, I mean something different. Uh, I grew up in Germany, so there's in team right now, it has become a four-letter word in German because it is, is an acronym for, for toll ein anderer macht's. That's great, somebody else is doing it. <laughs> okay? Creating a team means somebody that's committed to the outcome. That is the team's decision, not somebody on the team. Okay? Understand what a team is. It's not somebody that sits with you. It's somebody that actually falls with you, okay? Or celebrates with you. Manage the process, and I don't want to get into it. I mentioned 80% solutions, do it, fix it. Um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Prematurely declare success. Nothing excites more than success, okay? If you think you're on the right track, for God's sakes, get it out there. Because people want to be in a winning team. Okay? Tell the story, get them excited, because people, because the vast majority of us, 90% of us, sort of sit on the, on the sidelines and wait until something positive happens. But everybody wants to be on the train when it leaves the stations, if it goes someplace where you want to go. And finally, finally, take your job seriously, not yourself. You have to have a thick skin for this, you have to have a serious sense of humor to do this. So enjoy doing this. Have a great time with it, and I hope this, this was some helpful hints. Thank you. Thank you very much for that provocative and wonderful talk. And I, um, I, I, I think it's, given this kind of topic, it's very important for people to be asked some questions. So um, since I'm in control of the time clock, I would like to allow at least five to seven minutes for questions. Um, we can go over a couple of minutes on the workshops because we have a very long poster session at lunch. So I'd like to open the floor to, to people's questions. And I'm sorry that the dean could not be here today, um, but we are recording this for her. So, uh, and she asked that we do so. So uh, for any of you who are wondering where she is, she will get to see this talk. Come on, I know that there are questions out there. I know that Todd Hoagland has a question. Do you, Todd? Yeah. Could you elaborate on the enemy of good is perfect? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Have anybody here ever written a paper with 16 authors? <laughs> okay. Uh, the point is, at some point in time, when you think you have all the information, you've created a reasonable solution. Not perfect solution, but a reasonable solution. Put it out there. Because it is much more important to get feedback on what is, what is not quite there, rather than trying to create um, the perfect uh, product. I did a couple of te medical technology companies, and I worked with, uh, with a physicist who was an absolute perfectionist. And he wanted to perfect this product over and over and over again before it ever came out. We finally had to say, no, no, we are going to try it in three weeks. So it has to be done in three weeks. Whatever you have in three weeks, we will try. So you have to say, at some point in time, we will roll this out. And that's where experimentation is extremely important. Roll it out. If you're writing a case, invite a couple of students, have them discuss it. And you'll find out what's not perfect about it. Secondly is there's, if you actually open about it, that you're experimenting in front of a class and say, look, I'm trying something brand new this year. Uh, I really would be interested in you guys telling me what you think about this, uh, but I know it's not gonna be perfect. You know, we'll, we'll see the feet of the duck, as they say about from, from time to time. Do it. 
I think it engages people in the conversation. Um, uh, because I really feel by trying to present things as this is the way they should be and the only way they should be, I think you shut down conversations with other people and you actually get less information. So I'm, I am very happy to just put things out there and say, okay, what do you think? So that's... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you will you will find out very rapidly where you are on that curve. To be honest with you, and and clearly I've bombed. I've bombed totally. Okay. It is. Uh, okay. Now, here is where I actually. And this may sound very, either cynical, or realistic. Um, I ultimately feel that. Medical students will learn what they need to learn regardless of what we do. And just like in medicine, and just like in medicine, our first rule should be do no harm, don't turn anybody off. Right? So what I really feel is if you engage them in that and said, look, if you're telling me this is not working for you, maybe we can get together and actually do a mid-course correction, which most of us don't do. Okay? And I've done in a couple of courses where I said, this is clearly not working. Can we do a mid-course direction? I get together with them, and they say, okay, why don't we try this, this and this and this, and I actually change things on the fly. But you have to be willing to do that. And it's easier to do that if you roll things out as a pilot rather than as a whole curriculum. Some whole, uh, you know, I know that, for instance, uh, the University of Liverpool, I'll give you an example. Um, a good friend of mine, Paul O'Neill, is, uh, is the dean for medical education there. They redid their entire five-year curriculum, and it was paper cases for tutorials for all five years. Well, by the fourth year, the students, quite frankly, threw the paper cases away and said, we don't want to talk about artificial patients. We want to bring in our own patients. So they basically corrected it for him. He thought he had developed this perfect curriculum because every case built on another one, all the topics were covered. The students said, nah, it's not what we want. It's that sort of thing that I personally encourage to sort of you know, get people to, uh, to involve their students in doing this rather than saying, here's the perfect product. We know if you do this, you will be the best physician, public health professional, dentist you could possibly be. I, th I don't think we involve our students enough in this process. We, s we go to great pains to select these bright kids, and then we tell them what they should know not never asking what they should know. I know a business professor who had a consulting problem once. He couldn't figure it out, so he gave it as a final exam to his class. <laughs> he figured he had, he had 90 people in the room. If anyone was going to figure it out, it was going to be the 90 people, and he did. He got four perfect, great solutions. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a long question. That's quite frankly a, a total other workshop. But, um, oh, sorry, the question is, you know, um, how do you actually know when change is needed? And, you know, how do you determine what the goals are? Classically, if you listen to your stakeholders, people will tell you when change is needed. Now, who are your stakeholders? University of Ontario decided that their patients were their stakeholders. So they, when they wanted to change their curriculum in Ontario, they got, a, they got a survey of all the patients, and they, the patients came up with six of the seven competencies that they thought their physicians should have. Your students are your stakeholders. Uh, so I have, um, so I talked to a colleague of mine who said that he really loved his old medical school education. And I said, so why, why did you like it? Well, we had all these lectures. That, so I said, so tell me about the lectures. Oh, I never went to the lectures, actually, <laughs> because we only had somebody go take notes, and I stayed home and I read the books. I said, so you were the ultimate in self-study. You never went to a single lecture. So 
when your students no longer show up in your lectures, that classically is an indication that they are not thinking that this is of importance to them. Um, and that's a real issue. I'll give you a classic example for that is uh, we digitize all of our lectures, all of them. They're available on the, on the web within two hours of the lecture. Okay, so why would anybody go? So I have to figure out what is it when I give a lecture that they can't get by watching it. Right? And that, that's, that's, a, that's a real issue. So that's one, one example. Other stakeholders clearly are the society at large. And society tells us that certain things are not working the way they should be working. I think we have to seriously think about change. Uh, the example goes way back in uh, uh, or when science changes. I mean, I invite you to, there's a wonderful book that was published by UCLA on the history of medical education. It's, uh, and it's really wonderful because it tells a story about Vesalius who was doing a dissection in Bologna. And he's there with the body, and the real anatomy is right there, and the discussion breaks out in the audience of whether Galen or Hippocrates' anatomy are correct. Mind you, you have a real body in front of you, right? Vesalius is doing it, okay? And he couldn't stop the discussion. He just packed up his tools, left, and never came back. Okay, so what I'm saying is, in many ways, we have a tendency to not necessarily scan the horizon enough to see what we need to bring in. And that's very difficult. Because on the one hand, we don't want to constantly be moving around. On the other hand, we want to accommodate to the latest changes around us. And how do you do that? You, create, you have to create some sort of feedback loops. You have to really look for data from the people that you think it matters. And how many, how many institutions actually look at what they're, ask their graduates what they found useful about their education, or where they are now, et cetera. So very often we don't have the data, we don't get the data. So it's a complex issue. I knew Todd had a question. <laughs> Ah, it's a good question. Well, um, one, thing, one thing some schools have done is, among ourselves, we have done it. We've asked, for instance, the next consumer of our product, so to speak. We asked the residency directors of all our students that went there and said, two simple questions. Would you take our students again? If yes, why? If no, why not? But that's at least a four-year experiment. That's a four-year experiment. That's correct. That's exactly correct. The question, what, what you're asking for are sentinel events or, or things of that sort. And it's, it's very difficult to find sort of surrogate markers for what will ultimately predict uh, in your curriculum what you can do. And um, there's a lot of literature on that. I think it would be on the call right now of going into that. But uh, you can try to do this. I mean, one of the things, obviously, the clinical skills exam is one, one attempt at looking at seeing whether you've taught certain, certain basics that you need to teach. But I think very often what we don't do is we overassess and under follow up, under market research. I think what we don't do very often is really ask the people that work with our graduates you know, whether, what they were good at, whether they were not good at, et cetera. So I, I think I would highly encourage that because I think we rely on assessment almost too much at the present time and don't do enough informal data gathering from the people that have dealt with our graduates. I'm going to stop here because I know yeah. that um, Dr. Aras has to leave at 10.15, and also I want to try to keep on time for the workshop. If any of you have burning questions, you might yeah, email me or whatever. you can email, and um, uh, we'll provide um, Dr. Aras' um, address. But I really want to thank you so much. I think we could have used another half an hour for questions.